phone call, so if I do, you'll have to excuse me. But when I when I sat down here, uh, one of the guests came over and asked me, you know, how do I manage all of those things going on? And I don't manage it very well often, so that was why I was late. <laughs> but I'm, I do try. Uh, but I wanted to talk to you today about uh, business ownership and why I'm motivated to be involved in so many things in this community. Um, Winston Churchill once said, some people regard private enterprise as a predatory tiger to be shot. Others look on it as a cow they can milk. Not enough people see it as a healthy horse pulling a sturdy wagon. And when I bought my business, I aspired to that. You know, I'm not as eloquent as with Winston Churchill, so I didn't think of it that way. But I knew that I wanted to have a business that was strong and stable because there are so many outside things going on that you don't have control over. The stronger you are, the better prepared you are for whatever comes, the better you're going to be able to survive it. So. Um, when I bought my business, unfortunately though, I bought a business that had a horse that had been sick for a couple of years and a wagon that only had three wheels. And that's how I was able to buy it because it was reduced in price because it hadn't been profitable for a while. It was a wonderful business and I don't mean to be despairing in my remarks about it. Um, but it had gone through a life cycle and a management cycle that there, it, was, it was just losing track of where it needed to go. And so I was able to buy it, but I had very limited time to get it going in the right direction because all of my resources had been expended on buying the business. And so I had limited time, very limited financial resources to make it all work. So um, it was a race for me to get it healthy in time before my run money ran out and to get it healthy before the next economic downturn happened. So um, I focused my effort on getting connected getting informed and getting involved so that I could have the resources that I needed to make it a success. Um, what I want to talk about is, you know, my employee success is key, my business success is key, and this community's health is key. It all has to happen together in order for any of those things to be truly successful. And I want to be a participant in all those things because um, it impacts me and my business. Um, so I would say um, it was easy for me to recognize that my employees were the key. They were the foundation of my business. And so that's where I focused most of my efforts in the beginning, was to make that foundation strong. I had to hire people because I had to have more in sales in order to make it financially work. We didn't sell enough product in order to meet a threshold to cover our overhead costs and be profitable. So that was something I had to change very quickly. I added a, an additional shift, so then we were running three shifts a day. I worked on the backlog that my pre predecessor had acquired, so I was able to get some initial sales without actually getting new customers. So that's what I did. But in order to bring the right staff in, I had to figure out how to retain the best and acquire the best. So I got my first, one of my first things was to get involved in the Workforce Development Board. That's an entity that manages a lot of funding from the governments to uh, support workers. So they support training for workers, they support employers in supporting their workers, and I thought that would be a good place to learn what I needed to learn. Um, so they focus on excellent workers. Um, they also are a good means to access workers. So they have a lot of organizations like SAFER and ARC and some youth programs that gave me access to the workers that I was looking for. The people that work for those organizations are skilled in dealing with employees. And so what I did was I met those people and when I had an opportunity to hire them, I did. I brought them into my organization. Because frankly, I feel like I can teach someone to read blueprints, and I can teach someone to read calipers, and I can teach someone to run the, the program that I use to get my orders out the door. But what I can't teach very well are those people skills of, of recognizing needs, recognizing aptitudes, um, developing those things. So what I did was, uh, those organizations often have funding cuts and funding issues and their employees go into layoff sessions and then they go back on and they go off and on again. Um, I took advantage of one of the layoff sessions and hired someone named Deb Rickingham. 
she had no machine shop experience. I brought her in temporarily while she was on layoff, and she knew she'd have a job to go back to. And I trained her. I trained her to be a black belt, or a black belt in Six Sigma. And I don't know if anybody's familiar with Six Sigma, but it's a continuous improvement tool that helps you, I would say it's the best tool to help you figure out the resolution for a problem that you don't already know what the solution is. A lot of problems you have, you know how to fix it. It's just a matter of time and resources. But there are some problems that are so sophisticated you can't figure it out. So it's a tool that helps you statistically analyze all the inputs and all the outputs and when you're making changes, figure out which ones are making the right changes. It also helps you stabilize all your processes. So you take all the noise out of it so you can really see what improvements you can make. So I trained her to do that and she loved it. It's very rewarding work to make things better and she elected to stay with my organization, even though she had an opportunity to go back. So that was a huge win. I did it again. There's another individual named Jamie McLaughlin, and she's female, by the way. Um, and that's another thing that's pretty unique about my business. Machine shop that is led by um, mostly females is, is unusual in the industry. But I brought Jamie in, same kind of person, you know, had worked with people, had worked with training unemployed people, getting them where they needed to go. And I brought her in and I trained her on reading blueprints and she's my estimator. She's got not that kind of background, but she really doesn't have to have because I've got support staff that can determine what material to use for the product, can determine the time it's going to be on the machine. She just facilitates all that information and is a communicator to my customer. And it's, it's just been an excellent thing for me to have those kinds of people's skills in that type of role. Not many companies do it that way. Most companies will take a machinist that's good and have them be their estimator, but they don't have the other skills that are so key to your customer. So that was a huge benefit to me. And uh, so I, I feel good about that, that I focused my energy on bringing in people skill people. Um, and like the introduction, people often ask, what, what does your company make? And I have a pat answer, I can say it in my sleep. We make cylindrical steel parts for the ag and construction industry. They're very simple parts, we have a niche market, um, but they can be very tight tolerance, they go in engines, you know, blah, 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 blah. That's what I do. Um, but I was at the Pops concert last, I guess it was just last weekend, and I was introduced to someone new, and they asked me that same question, what do you make? And I had had a cocktail, and I had had a bad week. And I said, <laughs> I make people work that don't want to. <laughs> and it's not like that all across the board, but it is probably once a week. It's a, a fist fight to get someone to do what I have to have them do in order to pay their salary. I'm not a charity. They have to, everybody has to earn their keep. And their coworkers aren't getting paid enough to do their job, too. So it's a constant opportunity, you know, it constantly presents itself, that I've got to position my staff so that everybody has a good position so when bad times come, it's not easy to pick off the ones that aren't contributing. I've, I've already got them into a position where they're contributing and important. Um, so uh, getting the right people in, I do hire through the Safer Foundation and ARC and other organizations like that, like the high schools. I like to bring in young people. Um, and one of my motives for that is that they come in supported. They have someone that's checking on them, supporting them, making sure that they're at work and doing the right thing. And they're also, their training is often supported. So it'll be, um, I'll get a tax discount because I trained somebody. So they're, they're good employees, they're similar employees. Safer Foundation, I don't know if everybody's familiar with them, but they bring in people that have gone through the court system for some reason. Could be an OWI, it could be a severe felony that they just got out of prison for 15 years. It's the gamut. But their criminal records are very similar to the criminal records of the individuals that come in and apply anyway. But they've got the bonus of that support. So I find it very beneficial for me to work with that organization. Oh, my timer turned off. I could talk forever now. So I also recognize that my employees have needs. So they come in, and then we have issues that are just issues that they come in with, and that's one of them is health care. I share the expense with my employees. So once a year, when our health care is being renewed, I sit down with a group, you know, just a smattering of employees, and we talk 
you know, just real openly about what we want to do. Do we want to increase the premiums and spend more money, or do we want to reduce the benefits? And it's always impressive to me that people will talk on behalf of their peers. They don't just talk about their own personal situation. They talk about what's going to benefit this work family the most. And we make decisions that way. But because of that increase in cost, I got involved with Trinity. It, I felt it was an opportunity to bring my business experience to an organization that is a much different dynamic of efficiency and quality control. You know, they just do things differently because they're so far removed from the customer itself. The customer comes in and wants to spend as much, you know, money is no object. I want to have the best care, I want everything done for me, uh, and I don't really care what the cost is. And it's different than when they go to the grocery store and say, I've got a $4 product and a $3 product, which is worth more? You know, am I going to, is it more worth that extra dollar to buy this other product? And they make a choice that way. Often in healthcare, when someone's presented with that decision, they take the $4 product even if it's no better than the $3 one. So I, I wanted to get involved. I wanted to do what I could to eliminate waste. I wanted to learn more about what the future holds for my employees in healthcare. Um, so that was a very good experience as well. So now I've got my employees kind of going in the right direction. My knowledge base is where it needs to be, and I can focus on my business success. I got involved with Rotary, and Rotary is a wonderful organization. It does wonderful things throughout the world. They just are good. Um, but I wasn't motivated by that. I was motivated because I needed peers that were like-minded, like me, and had access to the information I needed. So a lot of experienced people are involved in Rotary, and they're very knowledgeable about who is in the community, and who is doing what, and who has what resource. And so I got to go once a week, Mondays at lunchtime, and I got to talk with these people in a relaxed, casual atmosphere, and I got to ask questions and learn. And it was wonderfully beneficial, and it helped me get involved in other things. Um, another thing that I found beneficial from it was that uh, as an owner, you're quite isolated. I can't, there's a certain distance between me and my staff. I can't share with them all of my concerns. I have to lead them. And so it's very nice to be with other leaders and be able to talk about those things in an environment that's not threatening to your organization. Another group that I got involved in is Roth Pump. They're a company that is of similar size of mine. They're a niche company like mine is, but they make a very sophisticated product. They are a wonderful company. The product they make is extraordinary. People from Taiwan find Roth Pump and buy their product. It's an excellent product. And as a, one of their directors, I get to sit with them and talk about you know, what risks are you exposed to? What, what are you thinking about as opportunities? You know, what tools are you using? Um, this is what I do. Why don't you try that? We talk about union environment compared to not union environment. It's just a wonderful experience for me. So I'm able to contribute as well as consume and take it back to my organization and make us better. Um, one of the things I've always felt is when I get to go through someone else's machine shop, you get to learn something that you would have never thought of. You know, they've got something there that someone's thought to do something better that would have taken you so long to figure out yourself. And you can just take it and take it home. So it's a big plus. I'm also involved in the Quad City Chamber, and that's a good experience because it's people like me coming together to look at our mutual concerns and try to facilitate the right thing happening. And I view the chamber as, oh well, the community, as kind of a family where John Deere is the patriarch and we're all kind of intertwined and, you know, we've got nephews of deer that aren't doing well, we've got a niece of deer that's doing very well, we've got a cousin over here doing their own thing, but we all are a family and our individual success influences the success of the others. Um.